All right, everybody. Sorry about that. The wiring gods were really not smiling on us right now. I blame BGA as I have for about the last 40 years. Uh, welcome to Crypto and Privacy Village. Thank you for being here. I uh, got another great talk lined up, and we've got Lauren Rucker, who's going to be talking about privacy within a relationship. Let's talk about you and me. Give it up for Lauren. No one's adapters seem to be working, so fuck it, we're doing it live. Um, <laughs> you'll see me look down a lot because uh, I can't see my slides to the right and see where I'm at, so I apologize for that. Um, I had an awesome salt and pepper talking about, uh, let's talk about you and me, let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be. So um, half this talk is going to talk more on uh, privacy law, and the other half is going to talk on privacy mitigation techniques. Um, especially, specifically, like, spyware. So, um, first thing I wanted to cover was a brief history of your privacy rights. So, the, in case you don't know the background on that, uh, the right to privacy was a Harvard Law Review article, and it was published in 1890, and it ended up coming about because of the invention of the Kodak cameras, and two lawyers at the time were just really concerned with how invasive that privacy was that people's pictures could be taken and distributed and generally how it would weaken the right of um, people's and their privacy and private lives as it could be published in the newspapers. So they ended up writing a pretty long uh, article published in Harvard Law Review and from that came what we mainly use now as the right to privacy in, from a law perspective and specifically, there's four torts or um, ways that you will infringe on someone's privacy. And the four torts are um, intrusion upon seclusion. And I'll talk through each of these really quickly. Um, appropriation, publication of private facts, and uh, false light. So the biggest thing that this talk's gonna hit on is intrusion upon seclusion. Uh, so if you're living with someone or you're in a relationship or marriage with someone, uh, the biggest, you're giving up a lot of your privacy rights because you're sharing so much with that person anyway. So intrusion upon seclusion is uh, intentionally intruding physically or otherwise upon the solitude or seclusion of another of his private affairs or concerns. And if the intrusion would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. So you'll see language like that in these privacy torts where it's really gray and um, what's defining a reasonable person and a lot of that's up to the court, and I'll go through some of the Supreme Court cases that have helped define this when you're talking privacy rights in a marriage. Um, there's also publication of private facts, so a lot of that has to do with if someone puts revenge porn on websites, and so that is protected by law. False light, where you're having slander if you're a public figure. Um, and again, we're going to talk about what defines highly offensive to a reasonable person. Oops. Um, so next up is our, if they're up there, uh, basically our bigger federal laws that help talk to privacy, and that's the Federal Wiretap Act, Stored Communications Act, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and uh, the 14th Amendment really helped touch on this subject and kind of cut through the gray. So wiretap, obviously, I'm sure you guys are familiar, but protects... Um, interception or access to personal communications and so that's supposed to protect uh, people accessing your data uh, your telephone taps your access to the internet and are they monitoring it and then with a uh, stored communications act that's protecting the computer and online accounts from unauthorized access and how that data is stored and it does also addresses voluntary um, disclosure so stored wired and electronic communications, and the records that are being held uh, by the ISPs themselves, or internet service providers, excuse me. Um, for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, that's a really overarching um, act, but in this case, it's talking about prohibiting access, um, unauthorized access to somebody's account or a computer, and not, you know, walking into, <laughs> not, logging into other people's accounts. Um, and then I didn't really touch too much on the Fourth Amendment, 
because um, that's talking about right to people being secure in their persons, houses, papers, or effects. But when you're talking about privacy within a relationship, a lot of that is shared. So um, the amendment, as far as a constitutional right, it's actually the 14th Amendment uh, that defines a lot of these further laws when you're talking individual rights to privacy when you are legally bound. Um, so I'm just going to, I had it up here, but just so you know the language a little bit. Uh, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So <clears throat> enforcing these privacy torts is really where the 14th Amendment comes in in order to protect yourself and your individual privacy. Um, so some, I'm gonna talk about some famous Supreme Court cases that have helped uh, define this. The biggest one um, going back in time and coming forward is uh, the Union Pacific Railway Company in Botsford actually. And this was back in, I think the 1890s. And so that basically had to do with individuals' right to privacy and making sure that that was a constitutional amendment and defining that, I think at that point, um, no right is held more sacred or is more carefully guarded by the common law than the right of every individual to the possession and control of his own person, free, free from all restraint and interference of others. And so that particular case helped define and solidify that privacy was part of U.S. Um, constitutional rights and for their U.S. citizens. So another famous case is the Einstadt and versus uh, Barrett, and that safeguarded a single person's access to contraception. So that whole co court case was about um, defining if you were single or you were married and your access to contraception and um, what came out of that was both single and married people should have access to contraception and be able to make that choice for themselves. It is the right of the individual to make that type of choice. And so even if they're married, they should be able to choose. So I know we're touching a little bit on like abortion. You'll see that in these um, cases I'll bring up abortion laws a little bit or contraception or reproduction. But um, that's a lot of the battles that do make it to the Supreme Court case um, in order to help define so the next one is uh, Roe versus Wade. This was a big, obviously, abortion uh, heavy, like mainly focusing on that and was really paramount. Uh, but again, it legalized abortion and then protected the woman's reproductive choice within the marriage. So again, protecting their privacy to make a choice. And so that's the main takeaway from these court cases is I'm not talking reproductive rights today, but the privacy to make a choice and these are some of the Supreme Court cases that help you um, see the background as to why you should have online privacy as well. <clears throat> and then we have Lawrence versus Texas, and this had to do with a Texas stature that was criminalizing um, different sexual acts by consenting uh, gay couples, and it overturned a, a lot of anti-sodomy laws, and it actually set the de work, groundwork for a de decriminalization of um, a lot of adultery laws that were still withheld in a lot of states as well. Um, I think about 20 states still had those type of laws, and uh, so it outlawed most of the time these criminal sodomy laws, passed over half the states, and outlawed um, all forms of like sexual expression between persons of the same sex, so it was targeting them specifically. So this particular case of Lawrence versus Texas um, put the choice back to the individual and their private matters back to the individual and um, that you couldn't go to jail just for having sex with who you want to have sex with, um, that, that that was a choice and that is your private choice to do so. Um, and then for the most recent one is in 2012, we had United States versus Jones. And that had to do with installing a GPS tracking device. They were actually, this one has to do with a drug ring more than anything. But uh, basically the, the government 
put a tracking device on this guy's wife's car, and uh, they had a warrant to do so, but they had to do so within 10 days, and I think they had to do so within, um, I think it was the District of Columbia, so DC, that's a very small geographic area. So they didn't install the device until 11 days, so it, the warrant had expired to do so, and they also installed it in Maryland. So basically what came out of that is the data was not used in the court case for that drug ring, and it confirmed that to do GPS location um, and get that data on someone and collect on that, you have, it's a, have to have a warrant to do so. Um, otherwise, it doesn't hold water in court. <clears throat> And we're talking a lot about law and court here because privacy in a relationship, um, if you want to know your rights, you kind of have to know the law and what has helped define that. So uh, a lot of the state cases as well. And state by state has different rules on what you can or can't collect. Or um, some of them just have gray areas. So I'll have a resource at the end that I'll say out loud. <laughs> Um, and it has a, uh, a great comprehensive website, like state by state, just to get you started if you're truly interested in that. And um, when I was talking to a couple of my friends that do practice law, um, uh, the biggest people they pointed me to for their state is it's going to be by state, and it's going to be um, divorce lawyers usually know that stuff um, way better, because when things get nasty, that's where people don't like to share as much um, sometimes. So uh, for state cases, this was a big one. Uh, it's uh, white versus white, and this was in New Jersey. So uh, basically what happened with here is the guy was kind of staying in the sunroom, and so the family computer was also used in the sunroom. Like family, kids, husband, wife would all log in and use it. Uh, the wife saw a letter addressed to the guy's girlfriend supposedly laying out, so she took him to court for divorce, and it was a pretty nasty custody case. Uh, what came out of that, though, uh, is because the computer was in a shared use space, and um, it wasn't unreasonable for people to view or have access to his shared files on the computer and his email, um, that actually no tort had been offended, so no privacy had been offended just because of that. So it's pretty defining. Um, again, it was a state course, not necessarily a Supreme course, but it's good to pay attention to because it helps know the precedence that needs to be set um, when shit gets real. And if you do want your accounts protected and you do want your emails not viewed by your spouse or not all the time, or whatever you choose to share with them, but to protect yourself. Uh, I think it's not as big of a deal, because usually we don't have one computer per household anymore. Many people have their own individual laptops, but just something to keep in mind, is that a laptop that many people in your household use? Who has access to it? Do they have different accounts you know, set up on the laptop itself? <clears throat> These are all things that, um, to protect yourselves and protect your spouse, too. You just you don't necessarily know how things end and how they can um, go bad. Uh, another good one was for, from Michigan. It's Lewis versus Lee Grow. And so this one's interesting as well. Sorry. Uh, it basically involved a, a relationship of uh, two girlfriends and one boyfriend. Um, he had invited them back to the bedroom. They had uh, consensual relations back there plenty of times. And I believe uh, they had a threesome. And he recorded it without letting them know he was recording it. So the ladies took him to court. Um, he argued that because his bedroom was a private place, there was a reasonable expectation of privacy. And you'll hear that in these court cases as well. So <clears throat> the court actually uh, cited on the side of the ladies um, because even though it is a private place, uh, they're not necessarily um, expecting to be recorded in that type of private place. That's the intrusion of privacy, even though it is a private area and it is shared. So um, if you've ever had friends or been in a situation where you have been recorded in a bedroom without knowing, whether that's the sex tapes or just undressing or just re recorded in general in your bedroom and you're not expecting it. Um, this court case, Lewis 
versus Legro is a good one to point to as far as uh, they ruled that that is definitely um, expecting privacy within the bedroom, even if you're two consenting adults. Um, <clears throat> and I think also the it expanded on this principle because it was a, a threesome, the private realm and the menage a trois, um, specifically rejected the notion whether the parties are living together or estranged as a factor. So in other words, one of these, um, one of the ladies was not living with this couple. So it didn't necessarily matter if you're in a relationship, um, married to them, living with them. They're, if, they're not, if they're coming into your bedroom, um, they're not expecting to be recorded. And um, a reasonable person would find that offensive. Uh, and that court was able to prove that. <clears throat> Next case I want to talk about is uh, Colon versus Colon in, um, colon, in New Jersey. Um, and this had to do with uh, the wife invaded the d defendant's privacy by recording and videotaping his activities, even sexual activities, in their home. The key to distinctive factor here is uh, she was recording it while in his office, in the home office. So it was not necessarily uh, a private area. And uh, I do believe she won that. And so, yeah, they held uh, the, the wife's video surveillance, even though it was in their marital home, and did not constitute an evasion of the husband's privacy due to being in a more public room of the household. So something else to keep in mind from a video surveillance, you don't know who's recording what where. Um, if you're going to do stuff that you would like private, make sure you're in a private place in the safety of your own home and that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy and that you would be able to prove that. <clears throat> um, so, TK, excuse me, uh, key takeaways um, from those court cases is the biggest factor here is intrusion upon seclusion and uh, the manifestation of an expectation of privacy. So what that means is if you do have to go to court for these types of instances, um, you have to show and or manifest an ex expectation of privacy. Like the ladies going into the bedroom. The bedroom is a private place. You go there to dress and undress. You go there to sleep. You go there to not be bothered. Um, whereas the guy who had the computer in the sunroom, you can't really say that's private if family traffic is coming in and out and everyone's using that computer. Um, so, the biggest takeaways are don't share passwords and accounts. Um, if you have a history of recording activities in a private area, because, um, you know, that's you and your spouse's hobby, or not spouse, um, and it's consensual, make sure it's consensual and they know that it's being recorded. Um, and just because you did it with someone who consented doesn't mean everyone who comes in um, engages in those activities is consenting. So consent is a big one on that. And then um, if the area is visited by multiple part parties, um, that's not probably, it's probably not a private place. It's not gonna hold up in court. So where we have the office, we're obviously a little bit more private, right? Not all your guests are probably gonna come into your home office, but uh, people do come in there outside of just the owners of the home and uh, the sunroom example as well. So. Um, I'll just repeat those again. Don't share passwords and accounts. Um, if you have a history of recording in private areas, make sure all parties are consenting to that recording. And um, if the area is visited by multiple parties outside of um, the people in the relationship, that's not considered a private area, at least in the eyes of the court in most cases. <clears throat> Um, the rest of the half of this talk is just talking just basic uh, security measures you can take to protect yourself um, in the case that you're in a relationship and you want some more privacy for yourself. Um, just good old common knowledge to not get hacked. And then um, also sometimes you, are, you see, find yourself in relationships that are a little um, aggressive or abusive and these are some ways to help. Um, so big one is phone settings, first and foremost, right? Pretty basic. So turn off location sharing features on apps as much as you can. Um, great example of that is Uber likes to track your GPS location all the time, not even when you're using apps. Um, might not be the, the best uh, app for grabbing a cab in that case. Um, 
being able to block and filter numbers, having a remote wipe feature, um, make sure you have a phone lock and code. I know where this is a hacker community here, but I can't tell you how many of my, you know, Midwestern grandma's friends don't do that. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think that's something they need to start doing and be aware of to protect themselves. And uh, disable file and media sharing. Again, going back to sharing of accounts. So if you share an iCloud account and you're sharing pictures that way, well, in the eyes of the court, you're sharing some type of account they can take you to court and say, well, yeah, I did have the right to snoop through your email. We're sharing accounts elsewhere and sharing um, media files. <clears throat> Not that it will hold up, just that that's evidence of, you know, you've done it before. Um, uh, when you're at home, if you feel like your network could possibly, uh, you know, pick up your, your network traffic, you could use a VPN enabled while on a wireless network, it's probably the best anyway. Um, also on your mobile device, if you're you're at a coffee shop, uh, just some helpful hints. There, you know, you have OpenVPN where you can VPN back into your home network, or you can use a paid service. Um, and additionally, there's helpful apps. So if you are in a more threatening environment from a domestic standpoint. Uh, secure messaging apps like Signal or CryptoCat are really great. And if, even if you do have spyware installed on your phone, they're not necessarily able to go in there and decrypt those type of messaging apps. Depends on the spyware and um, rootkit that's put on there. <clears throat> um, you can do apps that conceal your text messages or in calls like Vault or Shady Contacts. So it obfuscates who you're talking to. Um, and then decoy apps, which I think are every parent's favorite thing right now, um, conceal data in other apps and do like remote lock. Uh, an example of that is an app called Prey, where it looks like a certain app, you go in, you know, it has a whole bunch of different files um, and other apps that look like, uh, like a baseball scoring game, but not really at all. It's like a messaging app. <clears throat> Wee. And uh, we did want to talk privacy and social media. This is going to depend. There's so much um, different social media that everybody uses. So biggest one is turn off geolocation filters, um, knowing how to manage who sees your content, review of the privacy settings uh, that are even the advanced settings, security settings in, in general, and the notifications for multiple logins, you know, your multiple browser sessions and how to kill those, and um, two-factor authentication. <clears throat> and then for keeping online activity private in general, obviously two-factor authentication or um, unique and complex passwords, auto-deleting a history and cookies in your browser. Um, you can also do Tor, uh, just delete me, which is uh, saves you time by providing direct links for canceling numerous uh, internet sites. So Google dorking is a little harder to do. Um, do privacy mo mode in your browser. I know a lot of this is basic, and this community is really aware of that, but um, so many people don't know this. <laughs> so many of my friends don't know this until it's too late, <laughs> or they're in a bad situation. <clears throat> and um, DuckDuckGo is a search, uh, search browser, uh, not browser, Jesus, <laughs> search engine. <laughs> Um, it doesn't save your searches. It also doesn't sell your searches uh, like uh, Google or Yahoo does. Um, so that's a great one, even though like sometimes their interface is frustrating. Um, Disconnect Me is another one. It lets you visualize and block um, sites that track your search and browsing history. And I, again, for online activity private, I mentioned a bunch of uh, VPN clients like Hide My Ass, Tunnel Bear, Open VPNs. So that, uh, that one's free. And then, um, you know, for the more technically inclined, um, I would recommend Tails if they're super wanting to dive into that world. And if you don't know, that's a live OS, um, and you can put it on almost any computer just sitting on top of your normal OS and you, with a DVD, USB stick, or SD card. And it's a Debian-based Linux distribution aimed at preserving privacy, and it has Tor built in. <clears throat> It's a fun one if you haven't used it. And then um, did want to talk about if your laptop and stuff is in private areas,
make sure it's locked, make sure it has a passcode, otherwise that reasonable expectation of privacy might not be there. Um, encrypting your laptop's hide, hard drive, so when someone does try to install spyware or rootkit, um, they need that additional password notification to do so. Um, covering up webcams, <clears throat> and then uh, backing up your data, and change default passwords on hardware. So those are just some cybersecurity techniques for the home for people who might not be ridiculously technically inclined. <clears throat> And uh, I was going to talk specifically about some surveillance technologies. So ways you can be surveilled. Uh, you can have a spyware, or, and that can just go for your camera. You can go for audio, where it can record it and um, save it for later. Uh, content created apps, so going after like your Snapchat and going into Twitter and being able to pull that data. Keylogger, password finders, GPS tracking phone and text filtering, where it can even send phone and text for you. I know for this community, like none of this is a, a shocker, but uh, I talked to some of my friends who really just use their phone to take pictures and Snapchat, and a lot of this is like, what? Uh, I didn't know people could do that. <clears throat> so in general, spy spyware gathers info about a person without their knowledge. And I just uh, had a couple of examples here. Um, so for as low as $20 a month, um, MSpy, you can block someone's incoming calls and pre by predefined numbers, uh, monitor their content apps, again, like uh, any kind of social media, and um, you know, use their GPS location. <clears throat> There's also Spy Era, and that can listen on your phone calls, everything else that's happening near the smartphone and record it for later. Uh, it tracks text, it uploads copies of the photos you take, um, it spies on conversations held through other apps, such as Skype and Viber and WeChat, and it logs everything you type, so it's a keylogger as well, and even uses the camera to find, spy on you physically, and I think uh, you can grab that for about four to 500 a device that you're gonna install it on. So, I mean, if s someone wants to truly be malicious and they live with you, like, that's not too much of a hefty price uh, to start tracking people your significant other if you're a little paranoid that they're on dating sites or if they're talking to people. <clears throat> um, and then for key loggers, I'm gonna talk about Spyrix Keylogger. It's free. Um, it screenshots the active programs on the computer at intervals, and it reports the programs that are running back to the person who installed it. Um, that's a big deal uh, if you're living together and you're separated and someone gets a little jealous, you know, like, oh, fuck, they're on match.com. Like, it can be pretty aggressive really fast when they're finding out that kind of information and you're already in a bad situation. Uh, a fun one I found was uh, it's actually advertised as a backup data recovery software. It's DDI Utilities. And uh, you can download the alt program, remote send it if you know the phone number you want it to track. And just with a few simple commands, you have full root on that phone. Um, you're able to track everything, and I think it's only $70. And yeah, it's definitely advertised as a backup data recovery software, and yes, it does that too. But it tells you everything that's happening on that phone because it does that. And I thought that one was really fun because, well, not fun, uh, because it's a remote connect. Um, that one's a little scary to find. <clears throat> And uh, I did want to talk about the dangers of parental controls. Uh, you can have net nanny for your kids, but if you're in the middle of a separation or a nasty divorce, that can totally be used against you. Um, and if you're not familiar with net nanny, uh, that controls and access what someone's viewing from anywhere, anytime, using any device. You get alerts when they're attempted to download a certain something or if they're going to a certain website, bam, you get pinged right away. Um, Another one is iPhone Spy Stick, and it's just plugged into a USB port. It downloads all the web history, emails, text message, even the deleted text messages. Um, this one I thought was interesting. It's the iPhone dock camera. Um, so you think that you're just charging your device, but actually it's a recording video that's going on in the room, and it, it has a voice-activated audio monitor. A lot of parents use these tools to monitor their ch kids and their online activities, but you can totally use it for your spouse or someone that you live with too, under the premise that it's for the kids. <clears throat> Pretty interesting. And then just one more on that for the parental controls is Mobile Spy, and that's software that allows the user to, um, to follow a phone in real time, 
geographic location and see online activity. So a lot of these have uh, similar features, but each one is um, a little different. <clears throat> um, just some basic surveillance detection techniques. If you think your mobile device is um, possibly compromised, these are just some quick physical ones. Do you, are you getting battery loss a lot uh, quicker than you have been? Is it overheating all the time? Um, you can go in and check your phone settings and look at the permissions that the apps are doing. So maybe a new app's on there that you're not necessarily paying attention to. Um, how many people download not name brand photo editor apps, you know? Um, I'd say that's a big one, or at least for a lot of my friends it was, where I'm like, uh, that looks pretty shady, man. <laughs> where did you get that app and where did you download it? Let's see what it has access to. Um, and then uh, for anything that's like a net nanny or a, con a content filtering, you can usually just pick, pick, it, pick up the computer processes in order to detect the internet filters and content control software. Um, depending on what the software is, you're, or if you think it's a certain software, you can usually just kind of Google what inter, uh, computer process to look for. For NetNanny specifically, I think it's a OrcaWare process. You can go in there and kill it um, to bypass that for that session anyway. Uh, and then there's also spyware detection software specifically and uh, anti-rootkit -root scans. Um, for spyware detection software, I think uh, Norton Power Eraser Byte Defender Rootkit Removal. Kaspersky has a pretty good anti-keylogger under their security scan. And then Malwarebytes has a free anti-rootkit. So at least that, there's one product that's free. <clears throat> um, the biggest mitigation techniques for you know, getting rootkit and uh, spyware installed is actually keeping the software up to date and patched. And I know we hear that a thousand times, but a lot of these rootkits or spyware that's installed is specific to a certain OS, a certain, uh, certain version and below. Um, as the iOS or OS gets updated, those software programs have to get updated too in order to be effective. Um, read those end user license agreements uh, when you're picking up apps and seeing what that's really paying, uh, really asking for. I don't do it, but <laughs> you could do a quick uh, search. I do it sometimes, depending on a, the app. But um, also two-factor authentication is a big one for your device, your bank accounts, your email, anything where you're gonna house significant personal privacy data, you should really look at doing two-factor authentication. I've heard um, some security friends say, oh, I, I hate doing that because we share Amazon accounts and when I do two-factor authentication, they're not necessarily next to my phone. And it's just all sorts of red right there. Um, if you're and maintaining personal accounts, how many people live together and share a Netflix, Hulu, or Amazon account? Well, what other information's in those accounts that you're letting your spouse or significant other have access to? Um, pretty sure that's tied to your bank account information, your email, um, different addresses you're shipping stuff to. So actually, a lot of personal data. Um, you might even be using it on a business side. So then that significant other has access to some of your business information. Try and parse off separate accounts for that, like Hulu and Netflix, you can make you know, a separate account that they'll log into. Amazon, I think they have a feature now where it's like a shared household and you can have another account. However, with the Amazon one, they do not separate the banking information, so watch out for on, on that one to be aware of. <clears throat> I mention those because most people who live together, those are pretty common to share, um, at least people I know. Uh, lock your devices, encrypt your hard drive, so installation of new software is hard. And again, I'm, no, I'm just gonna say it one more time, don't share passwords. And if it comes worst to worst for spyware or rootkit, you know, back up your data as best you can in factory reset of devices. That'll get that off there. And um, since I don't have a slide up, I'm just gonna go over some of the bigger uh, resources. I think yeah, Violet Blue has a great book. It's called A Smart Girl's Guide to Privacy and Practical Tips for Staying Safe Online. That one's great. I uh, highly recommend that. I think uh, it's a free ebook or on a Kindle account or if you just want to buy it, I think it's like between five and ten bucks. I think she's even doing a book signing here at DEF CON. I can't remember if that happened today or yesterday. <clears throat> but it is really awesome. 
There's also a hackblossom.org slash domestic dash violence. And I was gonna show you some screenshots of that particular site. I thought it was really great because there's not a comprehensive guide how to secure yourself online that I've really found outside of that. And so um, they even have a quick exit button um, in case you are in a really aggressive environment and you need to do that um, and get out of the browser quickly because they just walked in the room. So I thought that was a really nice feature. Um, so they have different um, threat scenarios in that and it's like my press partners harassing me through my cell phone, harassing me through social media, um, stalking my location, surveilling my online activity, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they, they do a pretty nice little like overview walkthrough. It's just a nice resource <clears throat> that I thought was online and comprehensive. Um, and then some great organizations out there such as uh, Crash Override Network. They have a pretty, it's not, it's not super comprehensive, but they have some definite resources of how to protect yourself online, especially when you're talking like abusive relationships. <clears throat> and, um, but their main focus for Crash Override is uh, online harassment. So you'll see a lot of bullying sites, right? And a lot of information about being cyber bullied. But when you're living with someone, it's a whole nother level um, because you're expecting calls from them so you can't necessarily block their number especially if you both have kids that might be an emergency situation um, so anyway cash override for uh, online bullying also the national network to end domestic violence had some really good um, <clears throat> resources for those that would need help and another organization uh, called next door and I think Nextdoor offered support groups, even temporary housing solutions and self-sufficiency programs to help some people feel really powerless in these situations because as the victim, it's you have to change your life so, so much usually, not the other way around. And um, as far as I said, I talked to laws um, by state that are different for privacy. So um, victimsofcrime.org you can get in there and it actually is kind of under their stalking laws because when you're talking domestic surveillance, that's probably where you're gonna go um, first. So, any questions? Sorry for the, the lack of slides and me like looking down. <clears throat> any questions at all? <laughs> sure, I think there's a mic up here if you want. Or <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> such an important topic um, that doesn't get enough uh, attention. My question specifically is, do you have any counter surveillance recommendations for the crucial juncture where somebody is first leaving an abusive domestic situation and they need to escape to some other place? The surveillance, of course, would simply be able to track you if it's on your phone, but your phone is often going to be your lifeline to all of your other support networks. So do you have any recommendations for that specific crucial juncture in time? Yeah, for that crucial juncture in time, um, I don't have personal experience with that, but from everything I've seen on a resource is doing that first outreach, usually um, to a trusted friend or organization, and the biggest thing is have somewhere to go and have some stuff set up there uh, from a surveillance and tracking your phone. At that point, I personally, anyway, would leave my phone somewhere and get a burner. <clears throat> while you're doing that setup to leave and start making your own accounts and like say you're sharing Amazon or email because some some pe people do share email start making your own accounts and making that defined moment for yourself and not tying it to the other individual that you will be separating from because you can at least in a court situation show hey from this date we knew we were separating and um here is the proof of when that stuff was created. So from a law perspective, you'll be covered there um, from a domestic violence because I think that's a really scary situation is you really have to work with um, the organizations and friends that will be able to support you, get you away from that situation. You usually have a almost like a safe house, I guess is the nicest way to say it, or a safe space you can go to um, to get ready to jump ship and you like cut cut lifelines 
in a way um, from the other individual as best you can and don't share your location and new contact information and make sure all of your close friends and relatives know that as well. Um, that's, that's the best advice I have for that situation. I'm not a professional in that category in any means. Um, but if, everything I've read, I, I, that would be my ultimate recommendation. Any other questions? Sure. Lauren, do you have a, uh, a place where this brief is? Like a URL where it's going to be available? Um, I don't at the moment. I can totally do that. Um, I'll throw it up on my Twitter later. I'll probably put it on um, LinkedIn share slides. So my Twitter is, yeah, I guess you can't see that either. <laughs> Lauren K. Rucker, and it's L-A-U-R-E-N-K-R-U-C-K-E-R. -E -E Sorry, it's all together. <laughs> it doesn't have any weird spelling, so yeah, Lauren K. Rucker. And um, I'll be sure to put that link on there and I'll pin it so you guys can see it for a little bit. Yeah. So what's the expectation of privacy that children should have from parents, like adolescents and teenagers? What can they expect as their reasonable privacy that parents should violate? Yeah, I think um, I kept hitting on or running across that as I was doing a lot of research for this talk. And um, currently, at this time, um, from a law perspective, it's really at the discretion of the parent, since they are the parent and guardian. <clears throat> if a child is 18 and under, unfortunately, uh, you know, law has not caught up with the reasonable expectation of privacy when it comes to children. Um, so that's why things like Net Nanny, which are mass advertised, and a lot of these parental control um, softwares and internet filtering that you see is really scary and perfectly legal to purchase um, due to the fact law hasn't defined a child's pro privacy. I think possibly the defining moment is, you know, to I think to have like a Facebook or Snapchat, a lot of those uh, laws if you're 13 and under. Um, Privacy, as far as your parents concerned, doesn't necessarily exist. Privacy from other individuals outside of your family is a different story and uh, ultimately pretty protected <laughs> from that perspective. Does that answer your question? Oh, okay. Any others? Cool. All right, well, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Yeah.